This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Ah, forget the formal names. He's Kenny B, I'm Ray D, and as always, we are thrilled to the max that you decided to join us for another episode of the Farm Monitor. And to show our appreciation, we've got another great lineup for you. Listen to this. Legislative Session 2020 is off and running in downtown Atlanta. We'll look at some of the bigger issues facing Georgia lawmakers and hear why they feel the next few months are the most important. Also in the program, time to freshen up on that peanut knowledge and who knows, maybe learn something new in the process. Damon Jones reports from the annual Peanut Farm Show in Tifton. You're going to hear from an expert who said, producers, beware. And then later, ever wondered what those little holes are in your trees? Well, it's not a good thing. But have no fear. Extension specialist Paul Puglis has some tips that will help you scare away the little buggers creating them. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. Georgia's 2020 legislative session is off and running as lawmakers wasted no time on what's expected to be a busy 40 days. The Farm Monitor's John Holcomb explains how this year is expected to be a big one for the ag industry as several ag bills are expected to be debated under the Gold Dome. Session is now in session here in Georgia as lawmakers kicked off the second year of the two-year session. It's expected to be a busy few weeks, especially for ag, as there are several bills that farmers in the state are hoping make it to the governor's desk. One of the bigger ones being House Bill 545, or otherwise known as the Right to Farm Bill. This bill comes after the nuisance lawsuits against hog farmers in North Carolina and hopes to strengthen and protect Georgia farmers from loopholes in Right to Farm laws. The Right to Farm Bill, it just adds a little more protection to what farmers have uh, as protection from somebody that may want to move in and don't like the way a chicken house smells or a dairy farm smells. Uh, but also in Georgia, if you move into a zoned area, you have to sign a piece of paper saying that you know you are moving into an agriculture zoned area and there's going to be dust and smells and sounds and stuff that you may not be used to. So all this does is, is just add a little more protection for people that produce our food and fiber. Last year, the bill didn't quite make it to the governor's desk, but lawmakers are optimistic it will this year and will serve the producers in the state of Georgia well. I know when we think about right to farm, a lot of times we think about North Carolina. I met with a state senator from North Carolina that introduced the bill in North Carolina that passed in North Carolina. I looked at the bill that they had and, and my, uh, my goal has been to make it an even better bill that's even better for our farmers and it, and it helps them e even more. I think we've done some of those things. We got some real good suggestions from North Carolina. I met with Ledge Council. We had Senate research work and look at all the right to farm legislation from around the country, the ones that had worked, the ones that had had challenges and where they had challenges. So. I guess in conclusion, what I would say as chairman of the Senate Ag Committee, we plan to move that legislation out of the Senate at the beginning of the session this year. One other big bill lawmakers are hoping to send to the governor's desk is Senate Bill 211, or the meat labeling bill. This bill will prohibit the sale and advertisement of non-animal and non-slaughtered animal flesh from being called meat. We think it's very important for consumers and for our uh, beef producers, pork producers, all our farmers that people understand exactly what they're buying when they go to the grocery store. There are a lot of substitutes that uh, we have uh, products that are grown in the laboratory, maybe they're plant-based and then they're kind of passed off as a hamburger or another meat product. So we passed it out of the Senate last year. It's a two-year session, just like the Right to Farm bill. It's in the House, so we're going to be working because we feel like it's important for the consumers to know what they're buying. Reporting in Atlanta for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, John, thank you so much. In other ag news, that recent signing of the Phase 1 trade agreement with China reportedly includes the prospect of China buying 40 to $50 billion of U.S. ag products annually over the next two years. 
However, American Farm Bureau economist Veronica Nye says given the fact that the record for U.S. ag exports to China was about $26 billion back in 2012, that large number, $40 to $50 billion, has caused many to wonder where the additional $14 to $24 billion would come from each year. According to Nye, the U.S. will have to compete with other countries for the expected market increases. Chinese officials have repeatedly said that the purchases will be market-based. And a lot of analysts have interpreted that to mean that the Chinese government won't necessarily be directing purchases, but rather that the purchases will be made on their merit. That means that in order to sell more U.S. products, the U.S. is going to have to win market share away from other competitors. China's top five imports from the world in order are soybeans, which of course we all know, but then it's followed by dairy products, fruit, beef, and prepared foods. And if you kind of think about those products and where other competition might lie, you start realizing there's some pretty strong competitors in other countries that are going to compete against the U.S. for additional sales of those products. In the meantime, peanut farmers got a little nuts recently. Usually the case when they attend the annual Georgia Peanut Farm Show and Conference. Yeah, always a great event. It's a chance to check out the newest equipment and technology while also hearing about the latest research being done at UGA. Damon Jones has your recap. Informational sessions, trade booths, heavy equipment. No matter what you're looking for, the annual Peanut Farm Show and Conference always has what farmers are looking for. It's literally a one-stop shop for growers of one of the state's top commodities. It's a very good opportunity for all of our growers to see some of the newest equipment. All of the chemical industry is here. All of the seed industry, for the most part, is here. Um, and anything in between, anything that you need for production um, or to kind of help solve issues or do anything is right here. And that's good news for producers, as it's never too early to start planning for the upcoming growing season. We know things change, but the more and more you think about it now and kind of build that whole package together, the more, more informed you're going to be as a grower, and the best decisions you can make are the ones you plan for, you know, and understand what can go wrong or what uh, might go wrong. That way you'll have a plan A or a plan B you know, to work with. That kind of planning is essential for pest management, and while the particulars might be subject to change, growers are always encouraged to get a head start. I mean, we don't know now what the weather's going to be like, and we don't know what insect pressure is going to be, but we know that there will be insects, and so growers can go ahead and start getting in their mind things like thrips. We know what we can do to reduce the risk of thrips injury early. Growers need to go ahead and make a plan for that. And a great way to get started is to actually get out into your fields. I know sometimes people say it, that it sounds like a broken record, but the number one thing growers can do to prevent insect management mistakes is to scout. Walk their fields or, or hire a scout to walk the fields and know what's going on in the field in real time so that they can make the right decision and then choose the products if we have to go with an insecticide or not. Choose that based on, on real time information coming from the field. Due to the hot, wet conditions, growers faced major disease problems in 2019 and should expect more of the same this growing season. Uh, in a year like last year, and every year, white mold can be a problem. That's scarce flea spot. So my encouraging growers to look at what their opportunity is in terms of new products, in terms of production practices, and be prepared because white mold, leaf spot, and spotted wilt will, will be back in 2020. And if you're not prepared, they will take a significant portion of your yield. As for advice on how to combat these potential problems, remaining flexible is key in maximizing effectiveness. What happens if I plant peanuts every other year in this field rather than back to back? What's the rotation impact going to be? What was my disease problem last year? Looking back and seeing what happened in 2019, can I learn anything from that for what I'm going to do in 2020? We say it a lot at the University of Georgia, if you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you always got. And that means be prepared to change up, to call an audible, if you will, from football, to call an audible for what happens in the 2020 season. Reporting from Tifton, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, great job. Well, break out those aprons and cooking supplies. Up next, it's an all-new Meals from the Field and an all-new way to enjoy that good old Southern favorite chicken and dumplings.
All right, welcome back to the Farm Monitor, and yes, to another edition and another season of Meals from the Field. Joining me, as always, our dear friend, the friend of the show, the myth, the legend, Marsha Crowley, <laughs> our seventh year? Seventh year. Seventh year of doing Give Me a Fist Bob. I mean, yes. that's unbelievable. That's awesome. Yes, it is. So, uh, And today, um, in honor of me, Marsha wanted to do comfort food because obviously holidays are over kids are off back to school including my daughter she's back off to school so you wanted to give me some comfort some comfort some that's comfort hard. That's some hard. comfort food so yeah so what do we have here i see some chicken and everything looks very healthy and that's the thing i do like about um, this i wouldn't push that <laughs> you notice i said looks healthy, looks healthy. yes okay all right um this is a chicken and dumpling casserole mm -hmm. because making d chicken and dumplings like normal people do would be pretty much very boring sure. on TV. So, sure. all right. So I've um, I've already got this uh, mixture done because I was afraid I couldn't get all the lumps out of the sauce. Mm -hmm. So this is um, butter and I sautéed celery and an onion and garlic. Added to that uh, two thirds cup of flour and chicken broth, and that's what this is. Now I am halving this. So when I give you the uh, ingredients, mm -hmm. you can half it. Okay. 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 All right, we're gonna add to that four cups of cooked chicken. This is obviously two, and you can use a rotisserie chicken or cook your own chicken. I, when I cook chicken for a casserole, I tend to bake it because I think it holds the flavor better. Sure, <clears throat> I'm gonna opt for rotisserie. Yeah. Whatever's well, easier yeah. for me. And this, uh, and two cups of peas. Mm -hmm. Now at this point you could do peas and carrots if you really wanted to make it look good. Okay, that we'll just let that simmer a minute. Now for the dumplings, I cheat a little bit on this. This is two cups of prepared biscuit mix. Okay. They, there's two or three varieties out there. Add to that a tablespoon of basil, dried basil, and two thirds cup of milk, and you might need a little more. But like I said, I'm having this. So mm -hmm. if it doesn't look like that's two thirds cup of milk, it's because it's not. Just mix that up. And like I said, if you need a little more milk, just add a little bit. You don't want it too wet. You want it kind of dry. You don't want it too thick either. No, you, okay. no, you don't. Okay, we're gonna move that out of the way for a minute. We're gonna put this mixture in, our cas in the casserole dish. Hopefully I can do this without Send it flying Look through at the that. air. You're a champ. I'm a champ. You are a champ. It always makes me nervous, you know. Ever since I sent the flower flying through the. Now we still have that on tape. I'm sure that you do. I'll never live that one down. All right, then you're going to drop these dumplings by about a tablespoon mm -hmm. on top of this, oh. like that. Oh. And how, I mean, you can make the dumplings as big as you want, as small as you want. See, I would have mixed it all together and then let the dough form around nah, all of that stuff nah. to see what it came out like. No, no, it would have not looked <laughs> as pretty at all. And honestly, you could do the bottom part ahead of time and mm -hmm. reheat it, but I think it's important that this is, uh, the inside is warm when you put the dumplings right. on there. They won't be as doughy. Okay, you bake that uncovered at 350 for 30 minutes, then you cover it, and you want the dumplings to brown, okay. basically. Okay. And then this is the finished product here. Oh, that's heavy. That's heavy. That's a little it heavy. might and be a little, a little hot. hot. It might Still be a little, a little hot. hot. All right, we're gonna put that back. Well, uh, can I get a skin graph? Sure, okay. well, you can see the state. <laughs> and I see that I forgot to melt this butter, but whatever. Um, for the purpose of TV, purpose of we TV, shall melt the butter. This is melted butter. butter. Okay. And these are caraway carrots, and there's like two ingredients. Melted butter, mm -hmm. pretend that's melted, and about a tablespoon of caraway seeds. Okay. And you just pour it over the carrots, and you bake them for 30 minutes, however, however you like your carrots, crisp or right. soft. But here again, you can add carrots to the um, chicken and dumplings, because really, that's a meal in itself. Seven years, my friends. Seven years, and this is the first time she forgot to melt the butter. Wow, fire me. 
fire me. And I'm then, upset. I thought you were perfect. I am. <laughs> Not. <laughs> and then this probably doesn't even need to be talked about. It's just steamed broccoli. broccoli. Put okay. it in a bowl, a little bit of water, and saran wrap on top, and microwave it for like three minutes. And you can add lemon to it, any kind of spices you want. That's so, it. And there's your meal. Uh, there's your meal. And of course, your folks. Your comfort food. Your little comfort food. Uh, and again, you can find all these recipes by logging on to gfb.org or better yet go to uh, farm-monitor.com actually that's where the recipes are of course um, I'm not perfect either so it's uh, it's that's yes, why we it's make farm, a good pair it's farm-monitor.com all the recipes are there including the melted butter part uh, so you can get all the things you need there there's other recipes that you could uh, try out as well um, I'm looking forward to season seven. I, uh, oh, I can't really believe am. it's been seven years. So good seeing you again, you too, and Happy New Year. we will see you again next month. their economic impact is staggering and believe it or not only Texas and Florida have more of them. After the break the latest numbers on feral hog problem here in Georgia and what you should do if you encounter them on your farm. Hi, I'm Paul Puglis with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. We get a lot of calls in the county extension office about holes in people's trees. And so what's causing those holes? It could be insects or it could be animals in some cases. A lot of insect holes that occur on trees are actually really, really small, very tiny holes. Um, usually they'll have sawdust or sap coming out of them if they're associated with insect damage. But if you have larger holes on your trees, um, especially about the size of a pencil in diameter, such as this one right here. And you see lots of other holes that are kind of drilled in straight lines like this on the bark of this tree. Um, it's actually caused by a woodpecker, uh, specifically the sapsucker woodpecker, which is very common throughout Georgia. The sapsucker woodpecker actually drills holes in the tree to attract other insects like ants and other insects that will be attracted to the sap that comes out of those holes. And then they'll come back and revisit those holes periodically and keep drilling and drilling and eating those insects periodically as well. So that's a very common problem here in Georgia. A lot of people don't realize the difference between insect holes and bird holes. So in this case, birds actually drill holes that are kind of in a straight line. So I always say, you know, anything with about the size of a bird's brain is smart enough to drill holes kind of in a straight line. Uh, insects will never drill holes in perfectly straight lines or rows like you see here on this tree. Um, Sapsucker woodpeckers will actually attack a lot of different hardwood trees. Pecans are one of the favorite trees, magnolias, maples, river birch, um, and even a lot of fruit trees that you might grow in your backyard are highly, highly favored by the sapsucker woodpecker. One interesting thing that you'll find sometimes with maple trees is when they get drilled very heavily by woodpeckers is that sap will come out of the tree and it'll actually stain the trunk of the tree black. Um, and it's actually a sooty mold that grows on the sap that's coming out of those holes. The sooty mold is not harmful to the tree, but if you have a maple tree, especially a sugar maple tree in your backyard and the tree trunk is completely black, that's actually the reason why it's turning black and it's from the woodpeckers drilling holes in that tree. Um, you will sometimes find other secondary insects that will be attracted to those holes. Again, that's the whole reason that sap suckers are going after those trees. Um, and those things like insects, like, um, like ants and beetles and other things will be eating the sap, but they're not causing any damage to the tree itself. And so we don't really have to worry about those secondary insects. On larger trees, we generally don't worry about the damage that's caused by the sapsucker woodpeckers. In fact, older trees like this one here can tolerate the damage very, very well. But on younger trees, occasionally the damage can actually be bad enough that you can see damage where it will actually girdle the trunk of the tree. Or in some cases, I've even had small birch trees that have actually broken um, small limbs out where they've attacked it over and over and over. So in those cases, you might want to protect that young tree with hardware cloth. Um, a good example of hardware cloth would be, you know, like a cage type wire that you can get at the local hardware center um, or tractor supply type store. 
Um, feed and seed stores carry this a lot of times. Um, again, this is not something you're going to do on large trees, but for smaller trees, you'd want to you know, create a small cage to protect the lower trunk, especially on those young trees, and protect them um, until they get big enough to be able to tolerate that damage. So again, this is another problem that we see a lot of times. We get a lot of calls about these. And again, it's important to know the difference between what is a bird caused hole versus insect holes in trees. And more often than not, if it's as big as a pencil or a pen in diameter, it's not something that you have to worry about on larger trees. So for more information or if you have any questions, feel free to call your local county extension office and go to our website at ugaextension.com and be sure to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Paul, thank you so much. And those woodpeckers, well, they're not the only destructive creatures here in Georgia. Last year, 2019, wild pigs did an estimated $150 million in damage. That's according to the Georgia Association of Conservation Districts, who also adds that feral swine are one of the greatest invasive species challenges facing Georgia. Yeah, and the estimated damage nationwide by feral pigs, about $1.5 billion, according to USDA. But contrary to popular belief, hunting them is not the best solution, as explained in this video produced by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Hi, I'm Charlie Kilmaster, the state deer and feral hog biologist with the Georgia Wildlife Resources Division. Let's talk about a few myths with feral hogs. A lot of people think that hunting is the primary solution to controlling feral pigs. Despite no closed season and no bag limits, the feral hog population in the southeastern United States has exploded over the last 40 years. If you're managing a piece of land and you want hogs gone off of that landscape, you really need to set the guns down and start trapping and use a whole sounder trapping technique. There's a lot of different traps out there on the market, uh, everything from small uh, box or cage type traps all the way up to the remotely triggered traps. And there's a range of expenses there. The small box traps, uh, they're not really suitable for doing efficient hog control. If you're trying to catch a pig for some meat, then yeah, maybe that's the way to go. But if you're looking at effectively controlling pigs, you need to look at the larger traps, corral style traps. There's a variety of plans for constructing these on the internet. And then the commercial, uh, commercially produced remotely triggered traps really are where you get into the most efficiency in trapping pigs. The current method that we're employing on a lot of our wildlife management areas where we have hog problems are what's called whole sounder trapping methods. And these are remotely triggered traps that allow us to get the entire group, the entire family group of pigs into the trap at the same time and we leave no educated pigs out on the landscape. So if you're trying to control pigs on your property and you ride around and you see a group of pigs run off, instead of reaching for the rifle to take a pot shot at a few of them, make a note of that spot, pre-bait it and get a trap set there and get the whole entire group. Well, finally this week, as you may already know, on January 18th, Ms. Bonnie Duvall, wife of American Farm Bureau President and former Georgia Farm Bureau President Zippy Duvall, lost her long battle with cancer, passing away peacefully at home with her family by her side. Upon her passing, Georgia Farm Bureau President Gerald Long released a statement saying, in part, she was a strong Farm Bureau supporter and a true ambassador for the organization at all levels. Bonnie was always at Zippy's side, providing a welcoming presence wherever they went. She was a lady in the finest sense of the word. The Farm Bureau family is praying for peace and comfort for the entire Duval family in this time of loss. Miss Bonnie was 61 years old. We'll see you next week, everybody.